Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 724. That is 724 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you're doing swimmingly. How am I? All things are good on my side of the pond. I cannot complain. We have received some good news on the Manchester United side of things. Um, finally, it's been announced and confirmed by the club that Richard Arnold, one of the architects of our failure, one of the jobs for the boys hires from the Glazers, is going to step down at the end of the season. So it's looking like the new era under Sir Jim Ratcliffe's 25% ownership is coming into effect. Because a lot of people were suggesting or floating the idea that when Sir Jim Ratcliffe takes control of that big 25%, that he was going to take full control of the sport inside of the club and you know I'm, I'm still very dubious I'm still very skeptical about whether or not it's going to happen the Glazers have had a stranglehold on our club for more than two decades they have been with they have been like unwilling unrelenting um to get the club up to scratch and you know basically on par with all the other clubs in the world in terms of its sporting sort of like project and outlook so I'm not really sure I buy this idea that suddenly now they've had a fucking revelation that they should maybe relinquish the sport inside of control the sport inside of our flipping the club in order for us to get back um to winning ways because you know before there they probably thought or for some reason they had the thinking that they actually could do the job but they've had two decades of failure especially since Sir Ferguson's left and they haven't necessarily went to make a change so I'm very doubtful very skeptical that this is actually going to be a change you want to see I'm just happy to see Richard Arnold out of a job I'm also happy to see more than likely um, John Murtaugh is going to be Lex and hopefully after that Darren Fletcher get rid of all these bums who essentially have done nothing in their role so far they haven't really advanced the club none of the sporting projects that they kind of laid out had kind of been you know we've seen any kind of fruits of that labor um our transfer policy our player acquisition policy the way we sell players or the lack thereof of selling players our squad building is absolutely terrible so all those people who are responsible for it under the Glazers full ownership should get booted no one should stay it should be a completely clean slate to start with it's unlikely again like I said Jim Rackham only has 25% how much control can you really have with 25% especially with owners who are hell-bent on not relinquishing control which is the main reason why we actually are in position we are at the moment, because if they weren't to relinquish control completely, they would just sold the club um, to the highest bidder and walked away with a nice, fat fucking bit of money in their back pocket. But clearly they enjoy having a never-ending cash withdrawal system with United with the dividends, right? They can basically take money out of the club anytime they want. And they also enjoy the cachet, the prestige that comes with owning a club like Man United. And they also probably enjoy just the power, right? At that point, when you're that rich as the Glazers are, that Glazer family, it doesn't really become about the money, really. It's more so about the power that you kind of wield, the influence that you have. And the last thing that these guys want is to kind of not be needed anymore or maybe even not be hated maybe that's a part of it too they don't want to be not be hated so let's put ourselves in the limelight let's keep ourselves here let's remind everybody who we are and what we're about and go from there so let's see what happens i'm just happy which one hasn't got a job and hopefully after that john murder can follow and then darren fletcher get rid of all of those bums every single one of those bums get rid of them they're absolutely toxic i hate every single one of them Anyway, continuing on from that and not talking about stuff that I hate or stuff that I like, um, I was recently watching one of my favourite um, dance music nightlife podcasts at the moment called Das Techno Team. I know a lot of people out there aren't that great fans of them. I think a lot of people on some subreddits were basically pointing out that it's a little bit navel gazily, it's a little bit inside a baseball, they kind of just talk amongst themselves and not really much topics there, blah, 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 blah. But for me, because I don't really have a big social group, that is my equivalent of like going to an afters that is kind of like what i live for that little chat those mindless conversations where you feel like you're solving the world's problems whilst you flipping got ketamine and cocaine and mdma crust rings around your fucking nostrils and you're rabbiting on for an hour straight with no interruption and you actually think you're going to be solving the world's problems and you have all the answers i live for that that is probably the prime reason why I started to go out so often is to kind of just meet people, make friends, hang around, socialize, all that good stuff. So on the subject of socializing, I was listening to a recent episode and I guess they had a segment from the episode before last where they were talking about maybe the prevalence of straight men in kind of dance rooms, in dance floors, I'd, I'd imagine in nightclubs for the most part, are straights are, are usually the main issue here. But I think they were basically talking about this maybe shifting nature of the tone and the vibe of the dance floor where maybe now there's more guys who are out on the pool 
they're not necessarily going for the music. They're going actually to go and, you know, try and see if they can get a number, maybe get a little cheeky bum grab, a little kiss, maybe a little bang in the dark screen, whatever. But they're going there with the sole intention of trying to pull. And obviously, um, one guy in the comments or something was saying some crazy shit. He said something like along the lines of like, oh, you know, I don't think we have to mention like names, nicknames or whatever. But he said, basically, if I ask you for your phone number, you don't have to answer. If you say no, you also don't have to answer why. But I do have the right to ask you why. And some of the others uh, that commented or supported him or he, he, even he himself said in the next comment, if I'm in school and I uh, go through a test and I fail the test, I have the full right to ask the teacher why did I fail so I can know the, the mistake or can do my learnings. And then I answered him, I answered as a technical team and I said, listen, if you're in school, if you do a test, if you fail, it's the teacher's responsibility to educate you. If you are in a club, it's nobody's responsibility. If you're on the street, it's nobody's responsibility, especially not the woman you are approaching. It's not her responsibility to educate you. If she wants to, she will uncover the reason and will tell you why, but it's completely her freedom and her decision to tell you no or not even tell you anything. Exactly. If, if this person decides that their boundary is is lays in zero communication they have the full right to not even communicate to you yeah and you decide what you take as a learning from that so basically what i feel from him is that this um alibi of being uh of trying to be curious and trying to learn and trying to gain some experience with women and flirting gives him the 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 righteousness to say mm -hmm. hey I have the right to, to ask why. If you, if you do disagree, to, if you don't want to communicate with me, I have the right to, to understand why you don't like me. It, it just came across really, really rapey. I'm not going to lie. It came across really rapey, really creepy. I was like, whoa, that energy is wild. But it also made me think about my kind of education and my sort of like journey in nightlife. And I remember when I first got into it, again, it was mostly a necessity thing, right? So when I was promoting parties back in the day, we didn't have enough money to book DJs from the start to the end. So we just would have to play what I would call the graveyard shift where no one was there between like, I don't know, 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. until 12, right? No one would usually come out at the clubs um, before 12 p or 12 a.m. Now it's a bit different, I think, because, you know, people just want to get the most out of the night they're going out, especially they're going to spend big money. But beforehand, people wouldn't come out before 12. So you'd be playing for literally nobody. But you still have to play, right? And I'm a big believer in performing like you are performing in Bergheim or Panorama Bar in like a random dive bar in Dawson somewhere where no one's on the dance floor. And and the, and the speakers don't work and the knobs are all covered in fucking beer i was performing the same level right bringing it like i would bring it when i eventually do go play in burger and power bar sometime in the future that's how i brought it but it was obviously a learning curve to kind of get to that kind of level to kind of learn to mix and beat match and shit and whatever it may be and you know how to kind of program your tunes together sequence sorry your set list together blah 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 after that happened i kind of became a little bit more involved in the nightlife scene going out taking pictures doing little interviews and shit and just kind of going in you know falls deep balls to the wall um being obsessed with it going on holiday to certain places because of clubs going to festivals all that good stuff but my main priority when i was going out and i can say this hand on heart hand on heart my main priority like 80% of the reason why I was out was because I wanted to just to hear the music and chat to random people hear the music dance chat to random people that was always my vibe and it was never like chat to random people with the hope of trying to land or trying to like draw somebody because I, n I never really had that kind of intention or vibe anyway there were occasions of course we're all kind of human where you could go out and see someone and think oh my god this person's super attractive right and you could maybe try and make something happen in that situation but usually in my experience they don't necessarily materialize or go anywhere any kind of luck that i ever had on the dance floor usually came about when i didn't even know it was happening like I'd had a conversation with somebody They said, hey, do you want to go to the toilet? Do you want to have a line? Do you want to have a little bit of this pill? Do you want to drink this? Do you want to go to the smoking area? Then you'll meet with their friends and you're afters and then suddenly, oh shit, I'm on top of you. Do you know what I mean? Like it happened just naturally because you're just a good person, had a good vibe. And sometimes I didn't even notice it happening in real time. But most of the time that I was going out, it was solely for the attention of 
being there for the music, being there for the DJs, wanting to dance my fucking face off, um, you know, trying to beat my record in my head of how long I can stay in a dance floor without going to the toilet. All these type of things I'll give myself, okay, cool. I'm going to stay here for four hours. I'm not going to move. I'm not going to look at my phone. And you're just like, bam, 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 bam. Then you connect to someone on the dance floor without even saying, well, that's something that I used to love the most when I used to rave a lot. That thing where you're on the dance floor going crazy, fucking you know absolutely dancing your fucking face off sweating it all over all over the place and you connect with somebody sometimes it's the smoke you don't even see them clearly but you have this weird kind of connection without even touching without talking nothing and you end up just like vibing off each other and if anything it becomes a bit of a competition where you like you don't want to quit you don't want to stop you just want to keep going and it's fucking brilliant i fucking love everything about it but in my opinion that's the beauty of clubbing the beauty of clubbing especially within our little niche right where it's kind of quote-unquote underground is that you are leaving aside the normal kind of like um the normal the societal norms that people usually um go by when they're in nightclubs right which involve maybe dressing a certain way acting a certain way wanting to talk to people a certain way you leave those things to one side and you go into a nightclub in the hope that you're going to somewhere that's a bit different it's a bit of a departure from your everyday life. If anything, that's what I kind of envision when I hear people talk about safe space. I don't think that's possible, obviously, because, you know, it's nightlife. People are random. It is what it is. You can't control everybody's actions. But what I've always pictured when it comes to nightlife is more so the idea of creating almost like almost like your version of what a utopia would look like. Because I don't think a utopia is necessarily somewhere that is perfect and without faults. It's mostly just your vision of of what society of what the world could look like you're trying your best to do it like i always think of like private views store openings even stores themselves studio spaces record shops as like a way of you trying to basically create your ideal environment to let's say display your wares whether it's music whether it's homeware whether it's clothing whether in the most ideal way possible you're doing everything in your power to make sure that that experience is a bit different from other experiences that people have and so and vice versa right so i always had the vision when i go to a club um I'm necessarily always going there for the most part, especially if I'm buying a ticket to somewhere. I'm buying this ticket because I want to see a DJ perform. And then obviously, maybe especially in London, you might be thinking the other way around because our clubs are our, our clubs play a big part in the success or lack thereof of your night. So if you go to a, a dodgy club like E1, for example, right, they have amazing lineups, but the club is fucking garbage and the people that go there aren't the greatest. So you have to be a bit careful. Okay, cool. You might have to pick the venue first and the DJ second, but you're usually still primarily thinking about the fucking music. You're not thinking, oh yeah, shit, loads of like hot Scandinavian girls go here, loads of mixed race girls go here, loads of black girls go here, loads of Asians. Like you're not thinking about that at all. That's not even in your brain. You're thinking about the fucking music, thinking about the vibes, and then you're hoping to see like a good people out there, like a good crowd as people like to say on the internet that would maybe help to kind of you know um make the experience far better but you don't go there ever thinking i'm trying to pull if anything if you want to do that you can go to a commercial regular clubs and go and do that sort of stuff but i think you're kind of polluting and damaging the essence of what underground raves and techno parties are by bringing that kind of energy in those type of spaces you should probably leave it to one side and in my opinion I honestly do think if you go to a techno space, most more than likely anyway, there are people in there that are into all shapes and sizes anyway. It doesn't really matter. If somebody's into you, trust me, they'll let you know. You don't actually need to go around on a pool with your fucking fishing rod out or with your binoculars trying to hunt fucking women like they're fucking wild animals or some shit. You can just kind of leave it alone. And I'll guarantee you, if somebody's into you, they'll let you know. Man, woman, in between, it doesn't matter. They will let you know. Trust me. There's no way that you won't know that, okay, this person has given me the like the, the, the fucking hungry eyes or whatever or licking it. So whatever it may be, you'll fucking find out. But you don't need to be going around disturbing people's peace. And it's something that I had to kind of learn along my journey too, being a straight male going to clubs with myself and stuff looking the way that i do blah, blah 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 and you have to kind of just learn to kind of get over that sort of stuff and just again go in there for the rave and i think i re remember experiencing a little bit of that interaction when i went to hotbox and again you know i went to hotbox for the sole purpose just went to go to this place and see what the rave was about but obviously i went to kind of film or record these little pieces where i was interviewing people in the dance floor and asking them why they like the party so much and i was interviewing people asking people obviously and obviously asking people in the dance floor about their experience is one thing but then you're still having to go over and tap someone's shoulder and say hey by the way man, and i remember 
quickly being reminded, oh shit, I'm still viewed as a certain way. I'm still viewed as the kind of, you know, the straight black, you know, the straight single male in this sort of environment that's kind of going, up. it kind of looks like I'm trying to go and try um, to draw people. But well, obviously I was trying to ask them a question for the thing. And I got a couple of like frosty responses, which again, I completely understand because I'm still a stranger. But I immediately understood, ah, yeah, I'm also not really um, adding to the, betterment of the vibe because i'm coming in there with this sort of like expectation energy even though it's not energy because i'm trying to get their number to try and bang it's ex it's my energy to get an interview or to get a little soundbite i'm still going in there with some level of entitlement which obviously isn't going to get me anywhere yeah in short i just don't think it's necessary don't go into those kind of underground parties with that kind of energy just go in there to chill have a good time and i guarantee you if somebody's into you they'll let you know I guarantee you, though, let you know, you don't need to be going around trying to hunt for people. Um, save that for your commercial nights out. Even go to places like Fabric and go do that. People are more than probably more than game to have that kind of approach happen to them in their sort of spaces because it's a bit, you know, in the central-ish of London. There's more of a mix of kind of normies that would probably be into that sort of stuff. But I think underground events, you probably should urge yourself just have a different experience, like where, like, you know, little things that you would probably do when you're going out to, regular pubs and events and stuff where you are going to try to be on the pool maybe change your behaviors and see how that affects your overall experience like i mean like you know maybe not using your phone on the dance floor all the time as a crux when you feel like awkward and you're feeling like you're not really clicking with the event maybe trying to center yourself more into it listen to the music maybe trying to dance more maybe trying to stand next to the closest to the booth maybe at the back um maybe limiting the amount of, dr of, of drugs that you take maybe limiting the amount of stuff that you uh, amount of drink that you're drinking alcohol and stuff all those type of things try these little different approaches so that when you go in those spaces you actually have a different experience than when you'd go into regular spaces and it's all about the poor and in general like i said just leave people alone you know what i mean i think that might be a good way to go about things like people need to figure out ways i think there's enough regular normal people out on loan and in little groups and stuff where they'll probably end up bumping into you you bump into them and you kind of catch a vibe there's not in you know there's not necessary to go out on the pool like that all the time it really isn't you can have a great time on your own just dancing having a mosh you know head banging yourself a little bit and going from there really you don't need to do all that other stuff so don't do it chill out chill out chill out um move talking about chilling out uh, i won't talk about this quickly recently the other or yeah just this past weekend actually dvs1 actually played um in panorama bar of all places right i wasn't there unfortunately i really wish i could have been there but i do have some clips i managed to pull from various random instagram accounts um you know during over the weekend with some clips of some of the housey stuff that he was playing and i'm just wondering aloud in general if this is a weird natural reaction, DVS1 again, as you can see, our Panama bar, um, the lineup was Arm, Marcel Dietman, Danielle, and Baukhammer, who's one of my favorite residents there, um, Hiroko Yama Yamamura, DVS1, and Dinky, right? So a very house centric lineup and you see dvs1 there who definitely isn't somebody that you describe as house he's definitely main room Berghain, big you know um over your head banging fucking techno tracks four decks you know mixing in and out going fucking crazy absolutely amazing dj somebody that i think definitely lives up to the hype i've seen him perform three times here in london i think over the time i've been around and obviously once in berlin and i definitely can say he definitely does live up to the hype like he's absolutely incredible and obviously a super intelligent and smart dude and has some really good um opinions once it comes to the scene and whatnot but i was confused when i saw his lineup or saw him listed on panorama bar obviously it helps that he's a resident there so i'm assuming when you're a resident you probably get asked maybe to help out hey we've got a slot for panorama bar a certain time can you do it and they may ask you and then it could be a chance for you to maybe pivot but i'm also wondering because devious ones had some very interesting opinions about festivals about the scene about techno becoming commercialized i wonder if this is like a purposeful pivot in the same way that Etep Kyle did it, right? Etep Kyle, um, the guy that's married to the other DJ, Daria something, I forgot her surname, please forgive me. But I remember he made a very purposeful post, actually. Actually, it might still be on his Instagram, where he essentially said that he is changing from his regular style, which I wouldn't even call it only techno. He was a bit of a, what we were describing, or what people describe in a DJ world as a multi-genre DJ. In the UK or in London, we don't really have that, to be fair. I don't really think we have any genres. I think outside of maybe Tech House and maybe EDM, I think a lot of the DJs that occupy, like, I don't know, what would you describe Ben UFO as? He's not really... I don't, I don't think he's, he's, he's got really a genre. 
And I think most UK DJs or London DJs are kind of of that ilk. That might be because of our, you know, backgrounded with kind of radio and stuff. That might be the reason why we kind of um, have that kind of outlook. Um, but I think in general, we're very, you know, open to just playing whatever genres we want to play. So maybe in other places like Berlin, that's not really a thing. So you have to kind of really make it clear to people, hey, this is the pivot that I'm making. I'm going to be playing this type of stuff. So if you remember, I think, again, this is in September, right? So there's a post, as you can see here, Etip Carl in September made this statement on his flipping Instagram with a nice little post as well, wearing a Dior Tears t-shirt and obviously for, um, showing off the fucking lineup as all that he was on. But in the caption, he read the following. Dear friends, I'm closing um, Berghain. Sorry, I'm closing Panorama Bar this weekend for the first time and opening a new chapter in my musical journey. As it looks like you'll be uh, catching me playing upstairs more often from now on smiley face the past eight months have been quite transformative as i hit a mental wall last year which was a challenge but much needed lesson the thing is as a dj i've always wanted to selection to be guided by to be guided not by genre bpm or scenes but simply by the music that resonates with me i know that sounds obvious in a way however when you become associated with a specific musical style which in my case is techno, it can be very difficult to have a confined, sorry, it can be very difficult to have confidence to play with the complete freedom, especially when appearing on lineups uh, that are heavily one genre orientated. To be completely honest, I've been struggling with the tension for a good five years now. On one hand, feeling blessed to have so many opportunities to play music around the world. On another hand, I couldn't fully express myself as an artist due to the these associations for which I truly take full responsibility. I thought that if I start to decline bookings, I might end up playing not at all, and also um, seemed ungrateful um, that I have been given. So let me tell you again, I, I completely botched that. He said, I thought that if I started to decline bookings, I might not end up playing at all, which also seemed ungrateful considering what I've been given. Basically, I was driven by fear in the space. I initially entered out of my love for music. I've always, I'll always be grateful for everything the techno scene and the people I've worked with have given me. However, I can only rely on my inner voice to navigate through life. Therefore, I've been taking small, profound step by saying no to most techno oriented bookings requests to focus on the thing that I occur to spend more time in the studio. Anyone who has heard my recent sets in the final set in, a, in the right setting knows that I play across the board as much as possible. And I just want to say that moving forward, this will be my aim as a DJ. I aspire to explore all the incredible music that's out there and share it with you. I want to sincerely thank um, Berkheim Ostergut for supporting me and this and everything the club has given me over the years. See you on Sunday. Much love, S. So I love this statement from him. And it's funny because I remember... There was a period where I think he was talking about being depressed and stuff. I wonder if that was part of it as well. That's fucking crazy, right? If like the the you know the 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 inner turmoil that he was going through to kind of re, you know discuss or to kind of figure out what his sound was was even driving him to the point of depression. That's how you know he's really about this life. But I would also remember there was various posts on Berghain subreddits and other subreddits as well that when he played recently, actually specifically in Berlin, Berghain, the last few months before he made this statement, people were surprised that he was playing a lot of house stuff and it was kind of clearing the dance floor and a lot of people were kind of getting upset. But this now makes sense what he was basically trying to do. He was trying to be true to his intentions or true to his dreams and what, he's, as, what he tried to aspire to now going forward and he wanted to make that complete hard pivot. And it's, 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 it's upsetting in the fact that he has to make this statement in the first place you can't just be a dj and play what you want but i guess in berlin it's a bit different because you know of course nightlife there is a serious industry people take stuff very seriously they take their art very seriously they approach djing very seriously so maybe if that's the case the audience is also very serious so you have to kind of give them a heads up and let them know that hey i know you expect a certain sound from me but artistically musically i'm in a different type of mode different type of feeling and i want to go in this direction i'm letting you guys know now to give you a heads up if you don't want to go in this direction with me i understand but this is where i'm going so i kind of get where he's going with that kind of idea of kind of moving things forward in that direction all is to say all of this to say i'm curious to know if devious one playing in pano is basically his version of what etep kyle did and if it's a reaction to people like this sarah landry are you aware who sarah landry is i didn't know who this person was before i stumbled across a video of them on i think twitter there's a video of this lady on Twitter and she kind of turns back and looks all sexy and stuff, right? She looks all like seductive and whatnot, right? And hot and uh, behind the booth wearing this amazing tight black outfit. The crowd are going crazy. And she just has this one moment where she just catches herself like, I'm a bad bitch. You know, you can feel it in her. Like she's, I'm a fucking badass bitch. <laughs>
like in with all respect you know like yes i did this i think and i would you know i can't wait to get to that stage actually jeremy you know I mean? as a dj where i'm like standing behind the booth and i'm thinking fuck you did that you're a badass nigga right like that kind of vibe you could tell like she was feeling herself she knew she looked right she felt right the crowd are going crazy all her peers behind her sucking her off and shit three shots all over the place couple of baggies on the floor a bag full of fucking pills like just yes i did this right so she's feeling herself and doing it but when i unmuted the fucking video whoo the music was not for me it was not for me in the slightest but when i googled her i found out that she's listed as a guess what a techno dj and I was like, no way. This is not techno. This is not stuff that I'm used to listening to. So then I just decided to jump onto fucking YouTube, type in her name and see her boiler rooms and shit. And I guess I'm the only one that doesn't get it because look at some of the views of her videos. She's got a boiler room set here from two months ago, only two months ago at the Teletech Festival. Boiler room, Sarah Landry. And it's got 1.6 million views. There's another video here from a from a festival called um, Verknipt, Verknipt Festival in Utrecht, right? That's in Netherlands. It's got 191,000 views. Another one from Def TV, 1 million views, right? Like, oh my goody gosh, another set of hers, 272,000, 242,000, another one. An interview with 13,000 fucking views. 360,000 for another set she did in 2022 at that place um, in Verknipt and shit. So she's killing it, obviously. But it's a very commercial, it's maybe a very like, again, maybe closer to Serakin, but Serakin I think is a lot better personally. Big up my girl Serakin. I, I, I personally think she's much better than Sarah Landry. Like I would gladly go and rave, you know, um, go to a rave where she's playing all night long and I would never leave the dance floor. Like she's fucking good. Like I'm a, I'm a fan of her. I know some people don't like her, but I'm a big fan of her. I think mu musically she's a lot better than people give her credit for. Very, very, very underrated. But come on, bro. I had no idea who this Sarah Landry woman was and she's fucking killing it everywhere. Listen as a techno DJ, but obviously the sound is like very specific. And when I tell you it's very specific, I mean it, right? And I'm going to play for you a little bit. Let's just play maybe this one here. Let's do this one from the fucking boiler room, right? From two months ago. And we're going to just jump around so I can give you an idea or feel of what this is about. So you don't think I'm lying. Just, just hear this. Because this to me is like the worst type of music ever and that I could ever imagine listening to, um, you know, casually, let alone going into a rave. I couldn't imagine doing this to myself, you know, voluntarily. I couldn't do it. I really couldn't do it. The energy to t t Teletech. Up next, we have the sounds of the Sara. I love how they only get the niggas to jump on the microphone and introduce the DJs, isn't it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What go on, what go on. It's me, Nick Nog MC. Another DJ coming up in here. I'm not behind the booth. I'm behind the mic because I got a great voice. <laughs> BLM for black DJs, man. Where I going for this, man? Let me get the fucking flags out, bro. Techno too white. <laughs> anyway, let me scrub forward a bit so you can hear the vibe. Let's go to this bit over here so you can hear what the music sounds like because this is not good to me. That's the opposite of what dbs one's about no groove no nothing just like bom, 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 bom. whatever genre techno that is i don't want it but i'm wondering was that the reason why dbs one is switching to playing panorama bar maybe he's seen the fucking he's, he's he's reading the tea leaves he had somebody read his palm he was like you know what the end is coming and there's more probably there's more there's there's more range and more ability to play interesting stuff within the house umbrella than there is probably with techno it's probably quite limiting, especially now, because the stuff that you have to play now to get attention, it's not the stuff that everyone wants to play, right? Like the, the Britney Spears edits, the Madonna edits, the pop the pop edits overall, the Euro trash stuff. Like you have to really go down that route in order to kind of, you're, you're, you're basically, it feels like DJs are now having to like go down the Tiesto route. Like some of your favorite underground DJs are now starting to sound like Tiesto because that's the kind of vibe that people want now in clubs and shit. Like, which is kind of wild, which is why I think maybe in a few years, you're probably going to be seeing a lot more of those, um, what you call it? A lot more of those people that you would deem to be underground, even like maybe Teletech associated DJs playing at places like Tomorrowland, if they haven't already you probably end up seeing a lot of that happening very, very soon. Like, these DJs are going to be playing at Tomorrowland very, very soon. But to me, this stuff sounds, like, awful. Let me go back and scrub again another bit so you can hear what it sounds like, right? Let's scroll to this bit here. Like, what is that? 
Don't get me wrong, it looks full, looks amazing. All the kids are going fucking crazy, right? It's absolutely ram jammo, right? Caucasian after Caucasian person, rubbing shoulders, sweaty, having a laugh, you know, chins fucking swinging from left to right, from Timbuktu to fucking Chicago. But, but the music is absolutely shocking to me. Really is shocking. Let's, let's get this bit. One last bit and we move on. Don't get me wrong, proficient DJ, she's clearly knows what she's doing, but god damn it, man, I couldn't imagine anything worse to ever play in my entire life. So I'm wondering, maybe this is Devious One's objective. Maybe that's why he switched over to playing Panama Bar now. Again, I'm reading too much into it. I'm a little bit inside the baseball stuff. I'm fucking reading into stuff that doesn't really matter. And I'm obviously being a fucking nerd with this sort of stuff. But hey, the stuff I'm interested in. I wonder if that's the case. Or did you just feel in for somebody who, who got sick? someone got COVID he just filled, filled in and I'm making a meal out of it who fucking knows but with that being said there is a little interview here actually with DVS1 um, where he talks to a place called Sync um, it's an Amsterdam dance event at Spaces and he has a little interview here so let's hear what he has to say in general and this might give us an, an inkling into some of his thinking about the lineup and why he decided to shift to play at Panorama Bar in fucking Bergheim maybe this might give us an insight and maybe not who knows let's see what he has to say how is ADE treating you they said it's uh, really busy a lot of people to meet, a lot of things that I uh, signed up for. It's good. <laughs> How was your panel? I was really good. I was a part of two panels, one with Dave Clark specifically talking about this project that I started called Ace Life. Big up Dave Clark as well. Absolute menace on Facebook, always calling out the mad shit. Bit of a mad guy himself, but I love that guy. Big up Dave Clark. Bit Dave Clark gang, protect Dave Clark at all costs. And then I sat in on a second panel with some of the collection societies, uh, some music lawyers, and some various people kind of in the industry to talk about the bigger problem of royalties and collections. Tell us about Slice. A Slice, sorry. It's like a slice of the pie. I started working on this right after the pandemic started when obviously I had no gigs and I had time, saw a problem. And because I come from a kind of place where we fix our own problems, I decided to find a solution for it. Brought in some advice from people in the industry to really try to isolate the solution. And then I hired a crew, worked on it for about a year and a half. We did a private beta for six months. Now we're in a public beta for about just over six months. And uh, we're just growing every day. Yes. How does A Slice work? This is geared for DJs who make money playing other people's music. It's not meant for the bedroom DJ or for the DJ maybe playing at a house party who's making... Ouch. Devious Swan, you, you have to just um, reduce my fucking existence to that. Ouch. <laughs> no money. This is somebody like me who earns my living playing other people's music. So the goal was, how could we get money to the producers whose music we play? So we made it very simple because 95% of touring DJs are playing digital media. It takes two seconds to extract the playlist from what I played last night or last week. And then I can put that in the A Slice program, choose how much money I want to give, and then the city I played, the venue I played, the country, upload it to our system. And we, we built this machine learning technology that matches the producer and the track to the correct person and that i'd love to see the scale of djs that actually do that because obviously it's a, it's a voluntary system right you have to kind of want to do it yourself but i'd love to see the scale and i bet you any money the the rich the, the richer ones the one that the one the one percent ones the ones that are playing like in places and they're getting like a hundred grand minimum right i bet you they're the ones that aren't actually on there i bet you any money it's actually the quote-unquote working class djs who are the ones who are probably uploading their sets and their playlists onto that fucking program voluntarily themselves and giving whatever little that they get, but you know, equivalent little to comparative little to what their other more successful peers get um, to their uh, other, you know, to other producers so that they can share the fucking pie. I bet you, I bet you the working class DJs contribute way more than the actual ones who should be given way more, who are the ones that are getting a hundred thousand per set. I bet you any money. But of course, you know, revealing that kind of information behind the scenes isn't probably necessary and isn't going to probably do any good for your app that you're doing. But I bet you that's the case. Validates it. And then we put that money that that DJ gave, we split it across all the tracks equally. And then we put the money in that producer's account. And what we do is Amazing. if you're not in our system, when you reach a certain dollar amount, that you would be eligible to get paid. We find you on Instagram, on social media, on Facebook, and we tell you, you have money waiting for you. You just have to register and validate yourself. So th that's pretty cool, isn't it? 
that's fucking pretty cool imagine being some you know some random producer somewhere who has no idea your tune is blowing up you know and it's getting played all over the place and because there's a lot of tunes that get played all over the place that aren't necessarily popping on social either maybe because DJs don't want to be letting other people know about the tune id and stuff but you're uploading onto that fucking service and then somebody reaches out to you and you got a dm in your fucking mentions no you got a dm in your in the folder that you don't really check or whatever it may be and you're like oh shit you got some money waiting for you even if it's fucking a hundred dollars that's a hundred dollars that you didn't have yesterday so it's fucking sick i love it this differently than collection societies a producer doesn't have to register their music they don't have to do anything they just have to hope that the dj who's playing their music is honest and generous enough to realize that they should give something back the amount of dj's pay is hidden Yes, yeah, so everything is anonymous in the sense that we never wanted to create any top 10 or top 100. We wanted the <laughs> smallest DJ to feel as important as the biggest DJ. So whether you give $10 or whether you give $1,000, ultimately you look the same in your level of importance to the producer who's... Mm, you probably have to gamify a little bit of it, right? To be a really successful app, you probably have to have a portion of the app where people can really quote-unquote compete to see who gets higher up on the list right maybe you make you make altruism a competition it's a bit grim it sounds a bit gross i know but really if you actually want because the end goal should always be the presiding this it should always be the thing that make yeah the end goal should always be the most important thing the most important thing is to get money into the pockets of producers who are not necessarily getting the gigs that these djs are getting but they're having their music played in these places right and obviously get that portion of the pie that usually goes all the way to DJs and to clubs and split it equally with the producer of the tracks. Cool. If that's the case, figure out how, as best way as possible to get more of that money into their pockets. And I think part of it would be to gamify it and make, you know, and have a leaderboard where people can see, yeah, this person's contribute, maybe not an exact dollar amount, but maybe a rounded up amount about, hey, you've contributed, you contributed this much, you did this much. That would actually be a good thing. And it would, actually, it would actually be a cool thing for fans to see also that maybe a DJ that they love and support they might love them even more because they find out oh hey they're contributing way over the fucking market value for whatever track that's been uploaded on there i think that might be a good thing overall but again it gets a bit yucky very quickly who's receiving that because more importantly they're getting a notification that you played their music and then secondly they're earning some money for it but in their accounting it shows as an anonymous amount so ultimately you're not judging anyone mm. for how much they can give or how much they can support you the fact that they're supporting you is already the most important thing you can give as little as ten dollars you could give as much as you want so really this is accessible to anyone who makes even just a little bit maybe they're just starting to dj and maybe they only got paid 200 euros they can already afford to use this and it's not restrictive the max i've been ever paid to dj must have been 160 euros or maybe no one 160 pounds actually that's been the max i've ever been paid actually and that was at that weird hostel i went to where they said they wanted house music but what they really wanted was fucking atmospheric you know chill out sort of like kind of music house and all i had was you know fucking adonis house and shit right <laughs> mr fingers and it was absolute catastrophe i felt so bad taking their money but it is what it is they should have gave me better instructions beforehand i probably should have asked more questions but it is what it is really we built it so that the smallest dj can use it and the biggest dj can use it it's been good i mean we're not hiring pr companies we're not hiring uh people to sell this for us what we're really doing is we're letting this grow organically I so like we this. as a company reached out to around 600 to 800 artists before we launched and we invited them to see a demonstration to hear the story of why we're doing this the reality is that we're growing about 25 percent every month nice. with new people coming new producers new djs playlist submissions so if we continue at this rate it should be really good that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And I like the little smile that he made. So clearly it might even get to a point where he might actually start to, maybe that's the reason why he's doing the fucking house gigs then. Maybe the dependence on his gigs isn't as, like the having gigs isn't the main thing that's maybe, you know, uh, making him money. That's covering his fucking nut. Maybe now he's getting to a place where he's doing something that he feels like has a bigger purpose than just standing behind a booth and playing music, although that's great. I'm, I'm assuming at his point in his career, you know, you've probably seen and done everything. And maybe you think that, you know, the writing's on the wall when you see the fucking Sarah Landry types and stuff and whatnot, right? Maybe you're like, you know what? Maybe I should make more space for her to do her thing and I should do this other thing I'm doing. So that might be the reason.
Maybe the reason isn't Sarah Landry. The reason might just be the fact that this whole project, A Slice, is actually going places. And he's thinking, you know what? If I actually focus on this a bit more and take less techno bookings and do the old house set here and there, I'll be in a better place. Who knows? That might be the reason. I might have figured it out on live on the go. No, because what we do is actually very different than them. And we're not trying to replace them. We're trying... No, okay. Because what we do at this rate, it should be really good. Uh, any trouble with collection societies? No, because what we do is actually very different than them. And we're not trying to replace them. We're trying to collaborate with them. Because the problem that collection societies... Collection societies will not replace us. Collection societies will not replace us. ...have is that they have their established ways of collecting information, but it doesn't work. And unfortunately, it's not in a lot of venues. They're, they're using black box technology to listen, to record, but they're in less than 1% of venues in the world. So the problem is that they're only seeing a very small example of the actual music that's being played. Mm. So we're already in talks with Yuma Stemmer here in Holland, with the Canadian Collection Society, with uh, Australian one, with PRS in London, and we're working on finding ways to share the information that we have with them so that they can do their job on a better level than they're doing it now. We're just a, a solution cool. in between and then a potential additional solution for what they already do. Tell us about your gigs. So tonight I'm playing by myself at Into the Woods, closing one of the stages, and then Sunday I'm actually brought a bag of records and I'm playing an all vinyl set with Lady Machine because she only plays vinyl, so I brought my records and it's the first time we've actually played together. I that's a fucking good set, isn't it? Lady Machine and fucking DVS1. Hmm. I love that. I know her vibe. She knows my vibe. And our goal is to try to find the perfect place in the middle where we both just don't have to think and just feel off each other. Any music projects coming? I wish I could say that I've been working on music, but the last two years, really, I've been full-time working on A-Slice. There's... Ah, I think I figured it out, mate. That might be the reason why he's pivoting away to fucking house because I think, although... I think you probably around the world you'd imagine techno guys probably no I don't think that's true though because you think of all the big house DJs who are smashing it now at the moment I was gonna say uh, maybe techno guys work schedule or like gig schedule is maybe more relentless than house people I don't think so I just think at the top anyway you can you know the top is the top it is what it is the the schedule and the fucking you know the demands on you in terms of where you have to be booking wise are a bit crazy but maybe if you purposely decide to switch with genres it does take you off some maybe booking lists and stuff maybe people recommendations aren't necessarily the same so maybe it kind of by default slows down pace wise the amount of bookings that you get because you switch genres that might be the case um but who knows I remember the last person I think about that did that was maybe Dixon, isn't it? When you purposely, when you got voted, you know, DJ of the Year a few times in a row, you decided to only start doing like 100 gigs a year or something, right? Or maybe even less than that. And you know, it sounds still a lot, but, you know, before that, I think you're probably doing double. So maybe that's a purposeful thing that you do. No, maybe it's a decision that you make intentionally to switch genres and you hope the consequence of that is that some people quote unquote lose your number because you're not you know playing that music anymore so they get somewhere else to fill your slot that might be the reason there's music that i'm gonna come back to soon i'm hoping in the next six months i'll be able to come back to being artist zach but for now i've had to be business zach and that requires my full-time attention so it's almost like i'm working two full-time jobs right now outside of my full-time djing i'm full-time running this a slice project but i'm still djing every weekend i'm still getting to be creative and uh, at some point soon i'll come back to my producer side in my creative side and last word thank you for having me don't overdo it at ade <laughs> madness big up him don't overdo it ade is funny because of that fucking viral video clip of that guy near the canal going absolutely crazy um, i'm not too sure if that's real or if that's maybe a skit or if it was even filmed this year who knows but i remember seeing that on my timeline thinking oh my god bro that guy is going through it all the way through it and also it actually made me think actually i saw the other day somebody mentioned i forgot where it might have been it might have been on reddit or somewhere else this concept of fucking turning down in the rave have you heard of that so usually whenever I finish my session in a party, I'm usually trying to just get as quickly home as I can possible, right? But somebody said in some thread about how they kind of, you know, program their night out and shit because, you know, they'll do you get the more intentional you need to be around how you rave and whatnot. And I remember they said something on the lines of like, during their nights out, they will purposely start to like wind down 
as they're in the club, maybe the last two hours, maybe one, maybe four, whatever, and they'll maybe stop drinking booze, or start drinking more water, if you're in the fucking burger and you might go to the fucking ice cream bar, you might get yourself a sandwich, whatever you want to do, you're going to purposely try to use the last four hours or whatever window of you being in a party to slowly but surely down-regulate yourself to the point where you're not doing anything, you're not doing any drugs, not, not drinking anything, and that when you, by the time you leave, you're a bit more clear-headed as opposed to what I do and what most people do, especially British people anyway, you're leaving a club like kind of like bleary eyed, right? Stumbling out, kind of not really too sure where you're going and you're not really in the best kind of, you know, mood in general. And you're probably no, of no use to yourself or the people around you. So actually downregulate yourself is the best way. I know my kind of option to do that instead is to kind of walk. And I love to do that because sometimes the fresh air, something about the wind in the morning or how cold it is or whatnot, it really just, wait, you know, sobers me up super fast. So usually I'll use Bergheim to be an example. I'll usually stumble out of there whenever, let's say on Sunday morning, let's say Monday morning, hopefully. And then especially if I've been there for long after Saturday and shit, I'll stumble out there. And what I'll do is I'll usually just keep walking all the way to the station and if i'm not mistaken the stations for Bergheim are kind of i won't say far but they're like 20 minute walk so you've got enough time to kind of clear your head and sometimes i'll even do even further especially if i go to the one i think that's near isn't it alexander Platz or something i forgot where that station is on the, as you come out of Bergheim towards the left as you're crossing the park it's a station over that side right um i'll usually just basically follow the, the station like because i think that particular route, I think it's a U-band, that particular route is kind of overground, so you can actually see where this train's going. So I'll just follow it to the next stop and just keep following it until I get tired and then get jump on the train. By the time I jump on the train, I might pass the spare E, I might pass, pass the spat cuff, whatever, and got go in the water. And then, of course, by that time, I've already chilled out. I'm not as high as I once was. I'm not as drunk as I once was, and I'm just going to relax. And then by the time I get back into the Airbnb that I'm in, I might quickly jump in the shower, and then, boom, you have to sleep, and you're there with the fucking birds. That's usually what I try and do, but I've never heard of the one of, like, doing it in a club. That might actually be the best way to do it. Um, you actually down-regulate yourself. You chill out. You relax. You drink some water. And then by the time you leave, you're basically bouncing, and you're ready for bed, and you don't really need to kind of go on a long, expeditious walk, you know, through the fucking, the, the back streets of fucking Berlin to kind of go home and stuff and be more sober so i might be an approach that is you do going forward as well anyway moving on from that one quick one to mention this regarding e1 so i've long said and i've been on record of saying that i've enjoyed some of the times that i've had at e1 but i'm also very aware that e1 might be one of the best and worst clubs in london um it might have kind of replaced fabric in that respect because fabric's just like it's a lost cause by now right it's not really even worth going to as a punter i'm sure as a dj it's a better experience because i've you know like i said before i had the the i had i had the pleasure once time to kind of be in a green room at fabric a couple of times and it was actually quite fun i'm not gonna lie um to be in there with all the fucking heads and shit you know um um you know whatever they're doing in there having a good time that was kind of great i happened to fucking bump into ricardo villalobos one time over there so that was pretty chill um and blot no i think i might have saw miss kitten as well there um but anyway that aside fabric as a raver is a lost cause unless it's room two no problem no probably even bothering with that place right but then of course there's places like fucking e1 that exist that have some of the best lineups that you're ever going to see in london but the club is a failed state the club is a failed fucking club the security the layout the fucking lack of air conditioning like the the expensive drinks the lack of cold drinks is horrendous like legitimately it's so warm in there i'm starting to wonder now whether they actually do have a functioning fridge it's just so fucking warm the temperatures are so fucking high that even when you grab your fucking by the time the 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 the, the bartender has given you your tin of beer and you've got your fucking change or you've you know paid your fucking bill and you head back to your friends your fucking beer becomes hot chocolate it's absolutely crazy man it's nuts how quickly your drinks warm up especially if you're holding in your hand or your pocket body heat whatever it may be there's no way to get around it it's an awful fucking venue but as you can see from the lineups here on the screen they're absolutely incredible right you've got labyrinth here that's an amazing lineup you've got this great um 10 years of uh what's it what, what's that fucking label called Oh, I forgot the fucking name, but you see the, the lineup here. You got Kobosi playing, Kanda, in Verifu, Frank, Aiden, Afi Psycho. Like, absolutely incredible lineup, right? Let's just click that actually. Let's, what's that one? Um, let's see if it kind of loads up on here. Yeah. Um, 10 years of the R label group, right? And all these tickets are probably already sold out, right? They've only got VIP ones left over there. Um, fourth release ticket, 
25 pounds so they do absolutely great stuff right you see that one right there 10 years of fucking our label absolutely banging lineup of course anybody would want to go to a party like that so you see how that is great you got a more grab event happening happening there you've got grounded which might be one of the best ones they've done for a while right you've got rod had henning bear uh b for me d dan hyperactivist nini h like all the people that i absolutely love dj wise are playing in one place you got mix mag 40th anniversary there over moon bitter babe fold playing lo fi low low um flynn you've got e1 event happening with the i hate models antonio de angelis de harma ikata pablo buzi playing like incredible lineups but the club is hot. look you got e1 presents hector oats carmen electro um all these people that i've kind of discovered actually through whore actually you know that's crazy i think every person here with the exception of maybe donna and samantha togni I've discovered on Hoare, Hector Oates, Carmen Electro, um, Patrick Mason. Hoare, man, like, I know they're going through a bit of trouble at the moment, but they they did put a lot of people on the map. I don't think anybody would have probably, don't get me wrong, some of these people, Patrick Mason being a good example, would have probably made it eventually regardless, right? They, they're just so charismatic, so much of a star that they, they always had it, right? It's just a matter of time before they made it, but... I would have never known of Hector Oaks if it wasn't for Hoare. I swear to God, he probably was doing mad stuff before I found out about on Hoare, but that platform definitely deserves some respect for that one. Obviously not some respect for fucking, you know, being fucking um, Zionist sympathizers, but apart from that, they deserve a lot of respect. Um, then you've got the Teletech event happening with Anita, Solomon, Tekra playing. Uh, you've got a Labyrinth event here happening, which I'm not really too bothered about. Fuck them. Uh, blah, blah, blah. you got Electra, Charlie Sparks. Uh, you got a neat sixth birthday party from E1, DVS1, Dax J, Maron. Like, you got Percolate happening, the New Year's Day event, which is Helena Health playing all night long. That's going to be fucking crazy. You got per another Percolate event happening on New Year's Eve. So, two, oh, so you got back to back Percolate events. You got, they got um, a New Year's Eve one. Uh, featuring Ban Bernoulli, uh, Jab Job Josie, um, Leon, Leon Vinehall, Midland. Nicks and then you got Helen Health there, blah, blah blah. Anyway, you know what I'm I'm saying, right? Amazing lineups, but I swear to God, the club is a failed state. So my, my question when it comes to E1 is this: I recently remember somebody telling me a story where I might would I ever got told the story? I saw it on on a group chat. It's weird how that happens when you don't speak to people in real life. You start to read group chats and think they're actually real stories that somebody told you, a real human told you, and actually you read it on your screen. Ha <laughs> ha. But anyway, I think I read it on my screen and I saw somebody mention a story where they were at E1 and for some reason when they were leaving, all the security guards at E1 made people unlock their phones and they were searching their phones and shit and i guess the idea behind it was that somebody maybe in the staff make more sense maybe part of the security team had their phone stolen so they were making sure that everybody that was leaving no they were checking to see if somebody had a phone that they couldn't unlock you know and if they couldn't unlock it then obviously it was that security guard phone then they'll beat you up or they'll fucking arrest you and shit right but just imagine that it's not really your problem anyway so they're asking you to fucking unlock their phone or by force or intimidation so that they can kind of find out who stole whose ever phone it was in this space so obviously that happens quite often there a lot of pickpockets in there for some odd reason obviously there's loads of guys out there selling fucking balloons which is usually i think a sign of a failed club when there's guys out there pitched up outside of your club selling balloons it's usually a sign that you probably got the wrong type of crowd especially for me anyway it's not for me for some people it is it's not for me when i hear that i know for sure you know i'm probably shouldn't be here any longer than what i am there for so that's something that you probably have to kind of figure out but all that being said they clearly are doing something right with the fucking lineups right they really are doing something right like you think about this more grab event that features fucking more grab tommy Hulahan, clouds and loud like this is going to be absolutely booming with people right it's going to be absolutely full it's going to be crazy it's going to be absolutely nuts and all over the place so clearly they're doing a good job they know what they're doing when it comes to the bookings they've got the right people in charge you know even stuff like the grounded event and the people that are playing on there you have to be a bit of a head and have your your, your kind of ear to the ground to kind of know who to book in these sort of places in these sort of rooms so it makes sense that they're doing the things the way they're doing them right so it kind of all that makes sense and obviously maybe i'm just somebody that's kind of hating from the outside who knows but then i'm thinking as a raver maybe it comes to a point where you have to kind of accept the places for what they are and just try and make the best out of it but unfortunately for me i'm so much of a vibes person so much of a you know feeling orientated person when i'm in a space and i don't really feel it there's no way that i can kind of turn it around 
And I've used an example all the time when I talk about feelings and vibes and shit where, you know, there's been plenty of times where I've kind of been with the right group of people in a really shitty bar like a Weatherspoons and I've had a great time. And that is evidence for me that the vibe that I have or the vibe that I'm bringing with my crew is way more important than the people in there because by default, who would really want to spend their free time in the Weatherspoons? So the fact that you can go there and have a good time is proof that actually it's important to have good people and a good community around you. But unfortunately with E1, the way it is, the location, the size of it it's just too big of a club to it to make sense for it not to be this way because it's a, it's, it's a one of the interesting places because it's sort of like kind of I wouldn't say it's in the centre of London but it's a place that's easily easy to get to if you live south like it's probably the easiest one if you live south maybe with exception to Folds because Folds got the fucking um, Elizabeth line I think and no sorry the overground and shit they can go to um, um, what you call it um, somewhere around south I've got Canada Woods and stuff so maybe that makes it a bit easy but probably only Fold and E1 are two of the only clubs in East London or central East London where you can kind of get to from every part of London so maybe that's the reason why it's also really rampant and generally they have a very international booking policy so you know a lot of the Spanish come out a lot of the French come out a lot of the Italians come out and all the best in between to see their favorite DJ play so I understand this but for me personally I've had so many you know up and down times in there it just really makes me think like should I really be you know spending quote-unquote wasting more money going to a club where I don't necessarily have the greatest of time knowing full well that it's not really about me and it's not really about the person playing and it's not really about the event itself it's just more so about the people that go there that are going to dictate whether or not I have a good night and you know as much as you're complaining is one thing it's also kind of beneficial as an adult to just think you know what accept people and places for what they are and if they don't serve your purpose or they don't serve your needs just move on and accept the l because you know as great as this lineup is the sixth birthday party right nine you got you got the 999 guy dax j maron um blasher and um sorry um balsher and alt uh theo nasa playing there um anthony de angeles you know what i mean like it's obviously sick but ugh, do you really want to be in E1 in the beginning of the new year, like surrounded by absolute delinquents, like trying to make sense of your life and stuff, really? Like, do you really want to be at a teletech event in E1? Like, could you imagine to, like, ever again, like for teletech events, I've been to a couple that have been great, but then they're also, you know, mostly great because I just go in there, like, you know, wanting to fucking bury my head in fucking as much <laughs> stuff as possible. So maybe in some occasions when you're in these type of places and you're not in the right mood and then you bump into one or two, you know, dicey people on the way to the toilets, it completely shifts the way you kind of view the event. So I don't know. I don't know where I'm at with this, but it's just kind of a, a, an and what you call it it's just a more so an observation and acknowledgement of just how fucking up and down this place is as a place to visit and it's somewhere that i'm kind of needed to keep my eye open on and realize that maybe i have to just accept it for what it is make the best of it and kind of move on who knows who bloody knows talking about making the best of it i have to really mention this and give this guy a shout out because i had forgotten the power of little yatty i really did and little yatty's been in the news lately for some interesting comments he's had on the state of hip-hop and stuff and generally for his podcast blowing up um i think it's called a safe space that he does with his friend uh, mitch that's really enjoyable um there was an episode obviously with j cole that was a really kind of like full circle moment because of their weird history they've had together where it was kind of like beef but then it wasn't and then now since he's kind of you know been taken under drake's wing and people have maybe seen that side of himself being a producer a and r writer type of guy he's been getting a lot more great looks from people in the industry so things are kind of changing for little yeah easy perception but the thing for me that i've loved the most is more so the musical output the recent album that he put out that is basically taming part of influence sort of like rap music that was fucking incredible it wasn't even rapping actually it was just him kind of harmonizing on the tracks and stuff i thought that was an amazing risky ballsy move to make for someone in his kind of level especially considering the fucking detroit was it memphis is it detroit i forgot what that level is it memphis maybe it's memphis rap the album they put out prior to that to come out of that follow it straight after was fucking incredible to see but since then the singles he's been dropping and the videos the the the, the editing the production level on them has been absolutely incredible to see and even maybe thinking about style like i think i really watched the documentary actually recently i need to actually link it um on here and actually show you it actually a screen i forgot what the name of it was but this usual documentary did a really good job of sort of like depicting the journey of little yatty from when he entered the scene 
when he was like 18 with the red fucking plaits and stuff all the way until where he is now and it really did show what it means to be to be pers to be resilient to have perseverance and to really kind of be in it for the right reasons because i think maybe he was i think from the beginning even though Leo Etty took it more as a joke and didn't really take music seriously and was in it only for the money that's what he said explicitly himself I think what ended up happening in the beginning was what happens to most artists where you're not really confident about saying you're an artist because it comes across a bit naff right um, you're not really an artist until somebody actually pays you or tells you or refers to you as one so it's hard to really for you to kind of say it with your own sort of chest is maybe why people have an uh, a problem when Kanye West says stuff that he says because intrinsically you know you're not something that you kind of react too well to but he probably did believe himself but it was obviously a bit covert and then i think it showed it's true face because i don't think you can turn into that person I, I think he was always that guy who was always aware that he had more potential in him but he was just kind of playing within the margins playing within his potential because he didn't want to do too much which would attract more eyes because as we've seen the more he's been able to express himself artistically the more critique he's brought to his table so it's actually been um a positive and a negative right because more people are now scrutinizing the things that he says because he's proved the doubt was wrong musical wise and now he's got to a level where people are forced to take notice because the music is too good so the music's been amazing and for me that shows that you know the guy always had potential and for me it's like interesting because i was never the biggest fan of you even mostly because of the voice like i've been a, always like this when it comes to rap i've been a big stickler when it comes to voices there's something about voices like if i don't vibe with a person's voice the tonality of it the sound of it i'm just not going to have it case in point big sean great artist great rapper and whatever it may be but i could never get into his music just because of that annoying fucking weaselly whiny nasally voice thing that he has going on it just always fucking grated me and the same thing obviously with Lil Yeti, right he's got an incredibly redacted voice right um he kind of sounds a bit slow sometimes but that was also makes him interesting and kind of stand out right because it's a very distinctive type of voice they're very distinctive cadence very distinctive tone everything around it you can't really replicate that really and truly not no one really has that kind of voice then we kind of future and um now what we're seeing is him using that voice as an instrument and whatever it may be and obviously expressing himself artistically but what i wanted to mention here was his performance at camp flog Nar legitimately might have been one of the most impressive performances i've seen from a, an artist from his generation in a long time number one because i felt like it was a reminder to people who maybe doubt in him and maybe overlooked him about how many bangers he actually has like legit hit records that you forget that he has that will tear up most festivals most live shows absolutely killed it the crowd were going crazy obviously it's a captive audience right you'd imagine a lot of the kids that go to Tyler creators can vlog now will be big fans of yo so that makes sense but that aside he, I think, said in the beginning of his set, he went, he wasn't sure whether or not he should go and just play loads of new stuff or should go and play all these bangers. And he did basically a mix. He played some new stuff, but mostly it was just a reminder of all the hit records that he has. And obviously he's been on tour also. So this is kind of, this was the perfect appearance for him because he just finished his tour um, with Concrete Boys, his label and his group. And then he decided to do this um, performance at Camp Vlogna. So it was a perfect place to basically show off his um, performance skills. And he's got it down pat, rapping every sort, every single lyric not just standing there and screaming um i like that he looked different as well in the terms of his outfit he wasn't wearing the regular baggy shit that he wears when he's on stage so he clearly came on smoke i think he actually was wearing the martin mcfly's actually shoes as well which are i don't know 10 grand or whatever price they are nowadays on fucking StockX. so that was a fucking swaggy move but just in general i just honestly forgot the amount of hits that he has and i actually read in the comments here let me actually see if i can get a good um steal here before we continue but if i read the comments i'm pretty sure somebody broke it down look at that look at the crowd absolutely going crazy but you can see here the list right of the fucking records he pays with the timestamps, and you honestly forget just how many hits slappers this guy has um he starts off with um new song you see him uh, yeah new song that he's previewed that looks up sounds absolutely amazing obviously snippets always do to be honest but his one sounded great he plays solo step in creep boy slide um get dripped with carty that absolutely slapped um yeah yeah club nba young boat flex up coffin say my grace with offset peekaboo with offset and he came out obviously to perform as well then he performed bad and bougie absolutely tore it apart and he's good as well because he's been performing a lot live too during the summer so i feel like you get to see 
him kind of flexing his muscles there. Um, you got from the D to the A with T Grizzly. He played. He played broccoli. He played Minnesota. He, he played I Spy with with Kyle. One night, boom, Tesla, Mason ninety seven, Poland strike, um, fucking fu like amazing 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 set and i really have to recommend you check it out i actually put the link in the description for you to go and see yourself but honestly this was a really good set and i feel like a reminder of just how much clearer he is from his contemporaries in terms of absolute hit records that you forget that he has in his discography so it's kind of cool to see it kind of come around full circle so big up little yay for absolutely stealing the show over there at camp vlogna 2023 i enjoyed every single moment of that performance i enjoyed every single moment of that performance Anyway, that's been it of the Exxon Zinger Show episode number 674. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. If it's your first time checking out the show and you liked and you enjoyed what you saw, please make sure you hit the like button down below. That'd be greatly appreciated. If you listen to the podcast app, leave me a five-star review. You can also find links to all the show description stuff in the description, sorry. And of course, you also see the details on my tune today and my social media links. Yay! And of course, see you again very, very soon. And you hear my tune today playing underneath my voice right now. Peace!